Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Nia McAllister, and I am the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging circumstances we are all in, and I hope everyone in the audience today is safe and healthy. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Casey Goodson Jr., Andre Hill, and so many others. We grieve for all of the people who have lost their lives from police violence and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. As this list continues to grow, MOAD will continue to say their names as our commitment to honoring the victims and to attaining true racial justice for the global Black community. I also want to acknowledge the spaces that we're occupying. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent, our institutions were found up, founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands we are located. It is with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in a virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and we thank the indigenous peoples of the Bay Area and beyond who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. So I want to welcome everyone to Moad Online and to the program series African Diaspora Film Club, presented in partnership with Black Public Media. Our host, Cornelius Moore, is the co-director of California Newsreel, the 52-year-old social issue nonprofit film distribution and production company. He is also an independent film curator, specializing in works from and about the Black world. Modeled after a book club, we, uh, this event, we expect that you already will have viewed the film uh, when you join us for today's discussion. But if you haven't, please do continue to stick around. We just can't guarantee that there won't be any spoilers. But I do want to thank everyone who is here today for joining us um, with special appreciation for those who have donated and continued to show up and support the museum during this pandemic. We would not be able to produce this wonderful programming without your support. And so I want to take a moment and pass, pass it off to Leslie Fields Cruz, who is the executive director of Black Public Media. Thank you so much, Nia. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Fields Cruz. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am coming to you from, or I'm zooming into your homes tonight uh, on land ceded by the Lenape Native Americans. Um, and I just want to say how wonderful, wonderful it was when I learned that Moad uh, was running the African Diaspora Film Club. I, I, this was on a, on, we were on the same virtual event. And when I found out about it, I said, oh my goodness, Black Public Media wants to partner. This is brilliant. How can we help? And Cornelia said, let's try to make it work. And then with Elizabeth and Nia and Moad, Black Public Media is so proud to be a co-sponsor of the film clubs. And I'm equally as excited for you all to have this time to spend with Thomas Allen Harris, who is one of our um, gifted and talented and amazing filmmakers that Black Public Media has supported over the years um, in all many of his programs and just very excited that he is on and will be speaking with me today. So with that, I will hand it over to Cornelius and thank you all and enjoy. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I wanna officially it, introduce uh, Thomas and then hand it off for the two of you to, to jump into conversation. So today we'll be discussing the work of Thomas Allen Harris through both his award-winning documentary through a lens darkly, black photographers and the emergence of a people and his recent PBS series, Family Pictures USA. We are thrilled to have you here, Thomas, for our discussion. Thomas Allen Harris is a filmmaker and artist whose work across film, video, photography and performance illuminates the human condition in the search for identity, family and spirituality. In 2009, Harris founded Digital Diaspora Family Reunion, DDFR, a socially engaged transmedia project that has incorporated community organizing, performance, virtual gathering spaces, and storytelling into over 45 unique audiovisual events in over 75 cities. DDFR culminated in a national broadcast of Family Pictures USA on PBS, 
garnering an audience of over 5.3 million, which was critically re received, uh, reviewed by the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy. He continues to speak and teach on the value of family photo album as a tool for social change and is on the faculty at Yale University. So today we will start the discussion with Cornelius and Thomas, and we encourage everyone to participate by making comments in the chat and submitting questions through the Q&A box. And finally, please, again, take a moment to tell us where you're joining from. And I will pass it off to Cornelius and Thomas. Thank you so much, Ania. Thank you for the introduction and thank you, Leslie, and the, the wonderful partnership we have. Zoom is great for a lot of stuff. We wouldn't have, if we weren't on Zoom, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> oh, great. So thank you, um, Thomas, for coming. Welcome to you. And unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Cornelius. It's great <laughs> sure. to be here with you. And, you know, and I'm also very deeply grateful for the um, MOAD and also the Black Public Media, um, which has supported my work for almost two decades. And, um, and MOAD's doing just amazing work, you know, in the Bay Area. And uh, so it's very exciting to be able to be here during this conversation, of course, with you. We've known each other for yes. years. forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I've been an admirer of your body of work. It's, it's very extensive. And I really encourage people to, to um, find that, that work too the um, uh, vintage families of value. Uh, Aminia Kata, or um, That's My Face, and 12 Disciples of Nelson Mandela. Um, but today we'll be talking about um, Through a Lens Darkly, uh, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People, and um, Family Pictures USA. There's a lot to, to, to watch, and a lot, of, you know, that's packed with a lot of information and a lot of things we could, we could talk about. Um, I just want to begin maybe talking about you a bit because. Um, in your relationship to photography, your your brother Lyle Ashton Harris is a, is a photographer. Your uh, and, and as we see in the film, that your grandfather was too. And one of the things that I remember about all your films is that your grandfather plays such a significant role because he, because of his um, being a photographer, but also videotaping the the um, events in your family and videotaping the television whenever black people would come on, right? And that, and that was so special. I, mean, I see all these independent um, films, um, personal documentaries, and and um, and yours, I think, was the only one that had home movies, family home movies, and that was very unique and very special. But anyway, just um, talk about that relationship that of, of maybe starting you on your path of being a visual storyteller. Uh, yeah. Um, well. I grew up in, um, uh, for the most part, uh, living between two homes, my um, parents' home and my grandparents' home, and they were, they were separated by about three blocks. Oh. And um, so it was really an extended family kind of situation. And my grandfather was an amateur photographer, so he would ritually take photographs. And so you know, we were very much engaged in that kind of production of, um, of uh, uh, celebrating ourselves and um, and you know especially during Easter or Christmas or when the family would get together and so it was very much a ritual and it wasn't a simple click it was mm -hmm. you know <laughs> okay we went you here there someone's you know messing up in the back so we have to do it again and so it became like an event it's in and of itself but also the walls in his home and my grandmother's home were filled mm -hmm with and the television mantle were filled with images of ancestors and they were mm. people who um you know i wanted to create stories around you know mm. when i watched them and looked at them it was another time as a window into another time and so my grandfather was a was a really uh avid storyteller mm. and so he had a captive audience with me. Mm -hmm. And so, so a, a lot of those stories, those kind of oral histories were mm -hmm. really helped me. And then the third aspect of growing up in his home as well as we would gather as a family and watch television. You know, I remember mm -hmm. when Roots came out or, you know, uh, other national television events and we would gather around the television and watch the television, but it would be an active watching. So we would be critiquing at the same mm -hmm. time, talking back to the television and, you know, 
having internal discussions as well. So there was this um, focus on uh, kind of mid media literacy uh, mm -hmm. with regards to that to that that experience. And so yes. it definitely became part. And then when I got my first video camera, I asked my mom to join me and we interviewed my grandfather and he shared stories about his grandparents and so um, and also his his life. And so the snippets of those made their way um, into other films, either literally in terms of his voice or um, just having that awareness, that knowledge. That's a great story. What did you do with that? I mean, when you were doing the um, oral history and videotaping, did you think you were going to do it in a film? Or when you did it, did you have a particular place where you put it? Um, I'm just curious about that. Because we one of the reasons I wanted to have do the program with you is because we've been sheltering in place. And I imagine a lot of people have, whether well, it's not video, um, material but um photo albums or, or photos in boxes in some place and they said one day i gotta put get these together and organize this and that's what they're doing or at least thinking about that so um you know hopefully um people watching what you're doing inspires people to do that but what did you do with your grandfather when um after when you filmed it well um basically i um he, I, we only needed to give him a few prompts and then okay. you know, <laughs> he was off to the races, right? And so it was a lot of information that we knew and then some information that we were that was new. And so I wasn't sure how I would use the information. Ultimately, I, I eventually digitized it. I did a transcript. I used it in Amy Akata, the film, um, because in that film, I had a lot of Super 8 that my grandfather had mm. shot that I found after I went to Brazil with my own Super 8 camera and came mm. back looking for um, you know this this material um, that I didn't really know existed, but I was on a hunt for it anyway, and um, and so I used it as a way of setting up um, the uh, kind of idea around a search or a longing for an African diasporic narrative that was mm -hmm. really if it was it was really coming out of my grandfather's. Um, uh, interest and desires. He moved from Albany, New York to Harlem in the 1920s. He became part of Marcus Garvey's UNIA um, uh, kind of sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, they shared the same photographer, like, you know, if you saw in mm -hmm. Darkly, James Van Der Zee, and who was the, you know, the official UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey's, you know, um, global movement, um, uh, he became the official Harlem photographer for that, but he was also a photographer for many people moving to New York, wanting to um, establish themselves as kind of modern folk, you know, moving from more rural places to more urban places. And so my grandparents sat in his, um, in his studio, as did mm -hmm. some of their siblings as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I mean, because I want to talk a little later about the diaspora connection and your work. Um, but why don't we talk about through a lens darkly now? And that it, I, I noticed that Deborah Willis is in the film and her book Reflections uh, in Black: A History of Black Photographers is uh, mentioned a lot. Is, was it a, a collaboration between you and her on this on this film? And and if if so. Please tell us about what that collaboration was like. Yeah, well, Deb and I were friends from way back in the 80s. I met her through Ellis Hazlip, who mm -hmm. is the subject of the recent PBS film, award-winning film by Melissa Hazlip called Mr. Soul. Mm -hmm. And um, so she was following my work and she put me actually as a photographer into my one of my first shows, my first few shows. Okay. And I'm also in the book as well with a collaboration okay. I did with Lyle. And mm -hmm. so uh, about 2002 or three, she approached me about doing, uh, turning the book into a film. Mm -hmm. And so the book is a kind of cataloging of Black African-American contributions to the field of photography from the invention of photography in 1839 to what was then the present, which was um, 1999 approximately. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the challenge was, well, how do I turn a kind of encyclopedic book mm -hmm. into a film? Mm -hmm. And so it, you know, ultimately it, uh, I think I started working on the project. I started shooting the project really in 2005. We were developing the project, trying to get money for it, for 
several years before things, you know, kind of we started getting money in. Mm. And so what the film turned out turned into was, you know, is a kind of I for me it was really important to do two things. One, kind of build flesh around the the project in the sense of, well, what were these black photographers up against? Like what was the drama? Like, you know, we see these beautiful pictures that, you know, it's very rare to see black, you know, folks lifting themselves up and documenting themselves. But but why was this special? You know, what was going on? What were the dominant images there? And so that set me on a mission to actually do like kind of basically we we sourced over 25,000 images, you know, like what were the dominant images in the 1880s and 1890s and the 1850s, uh -huh. um, in 1910, whatever. And, um, and where were they and how were African Americans depicted, you know, in those images and mm -hmm. what was the difference between their depiction there and the depiction of African American photographers. And so that, that drama was something I really, it was, you know, struggled to kind of create a narrative, a visual narrative that mm -hmm. would really viscerally take people through. And at the same time, I didn't want this film to be, okay, we have all the like experts at the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. you know, historic historians. And at the, the last third, all the contemporary photographers, even if they're, you know, older, you know, like bunched up, say 1950. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so as I was writing one grant, I realized that the way to do it, and I also, you know, I was a part of this community of photographers and artists, and I realized how many of us used, um, used like history in our work. You know, whether it's Carrie Mae Weens or Lyle Ashton Harris or Glenn Ligon or, you know, uh, a number of uh, or Renee Cox, you know, a number mm -hmm. of folks use history as a kind of uh, historical narratives and the kind of recreation of them or the uh, appropriation of the archives to construct artworks that were photo based. Mm -hmm. And so it occurred to me that I could actually create a kind of disrupt the linearity and at the same time talk about how history, the cyclic aspect of history. And, you know, in, in some ways, the film for me is a kind of a, a kind of a treatise on the sci fi aspect of the black American experience, you know, that we see ourselves as human, you know, uh -huh. but you know, th there's a whole like a river of material that says we're not human we're this that the other anything but human you know mm -hmm. and all these other people including ourselves are consuming that you know mm -hmm. and implicated in that and um and so so i really wanted to actually talk about that struggle um mm -hmm. in a kind of a visceral way and and of course i had been doing for a number of years as you mentioned earlier uh this working with the motif of the family album and so mm -hmm. it occurred to me that that would be a very good you know, next step in terms of thinking about the film as what do the, you know, if, if there was a, a real family album of America, what would that, what would African Americans look like within that family mm -hmm. album? Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I, what, I'm reflecting on some of the things in the, in the, in the, in the 19th century that I learned about, for example, Frederick Douglass being the most photographed person. And Sojourner Truth using photography, um, and I think Nell Irvin Painter talks about um, her using photography as her calling card as a way to um, raise money, but also represent herself. For herself. Um, and the other thing I'll think about is how um, the Union Black Union soldiers wanted to have present themselves, you know, wanted to have themselves photographed. So to you know, for people to to use this medium as an empowering thing for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to say that, you know, we are here, we've done this, you mm -hmm. know, um, that we are also, um, uh, in the case of Sojourner Truth and also Frederick Douglass, they really use their, their um, the camera, which was new technology then, similar mm -hmm. to the way the internet is, you know, over the last 20 years. And so this kind of, medium that allowed for mm -hmm. representation to happen and for you to then represent have control over your representation was very mm -hmm. very you know new and it was relatively affordable 
um, you know, it wasn't completely affordable, but it's relatively affordable relative to, you know, portrait painting, which only the, you know, the upper middle classes and wealthy and royalty mm-hmm. had at their disposal. And, um, but Sojourner Truth in particular used it so to support her abolitionist activities, as did Frederick Douglass, you know, and 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 she used it in terms of you know selling those images. Frederick Douglass used it in terms of offering a kind of a, a, a counterpoint to the dominant image of serv- servility, you know, cowardice, mm-hmm. uh, all these stereotypes that were really kind of put on African American. Um, uh, yeah, people and mm. and eat despite the fact that you know we had already fought the Revolutionary War, <laughs> you know mm. we had you know fought the Civil War, you know, and so these images of black soldiers, you know, in uh, really um, taking the camera and also the narratives that are behind those images. I've seen a lot of those images because they're also at Yale uh, in the Beinecke Library. And in fact, Deb Willis just came out with a, a, a book, which, um, which I, I have just ordered um, uh, about those images. Um, but the, those images are so, um, why are those images, which are so important in terms of the history, why are they so rare for us to have access you know, to them? Um, there were, you know, th- th- tens of thousands mm-hmm. of these images. Mm-hmm. One of the things um, I'm sort of thought about was um, the access of people to being photographed and the, the whole uh, issue of class and economic, um, you know, ec- economic ability to, to be photographed because before people were, had private cameras at their disposal, they would have to go to a, um, a professional photographer, and and I was just wondering when you, in your research how how did were there a lot of black photographers being able to do that? Again, like most black people in in the first in in the eight, 19th century and the beginning of the, the 20th century were in the South. So, what kind of a challenge that was to find somebody who would photograph them? Um, and if there was enough business, basically, for a black photographer to make a living doing that, or did, or did they have to do that on the side? And this is a sort of a wild card question. Um, I was yeah, curious I, what you I, found out. Yeah, I could, t- I could tackle that. I mean, I think that, first of all, uh, people who were really living in a subsistence way were not able to afford have the luxury of having the pictures taken. It was really people who had, you know, a, a, even just a, mod- a modicum of disposable income in terms of mm-hmm. African American, you know, maybe more entering into the working class. You know, mm-hmm. they're able to control their labor somehow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and then obviously the middle classes, um, but there were. Uh, traveling photographers, and in mm-hmm. fact, the the work as a photographer was considered to be uh, a, a really great, um, uh, a, a, a lucrative profession. Huh. Uh, you had people like James Presley Ball that you know, Deb Willis talks about, and he she's written you know a book about him. Uh, he traveled from Ohio all the way to Montana, uh, ended up in in, in um, Hawaii. Um, but you had a lot of itinerant photographers mm-hmm. who would go to different places and take their uh, their backdrops and photograph folks. So it's, it was like a kind of portable studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, um, Frederick Douglass really encouraged through his newspaper African-American men to take up the camera as a way not only to change the nar- visual narrative of black folks, but also as economic opportunity. Hmm. Uh, a lot of institutions, African-American institutions in particular, were hiring, hired, had their own photography departments and also hired photographers to document their narrative. And it was a way of controlling and disseminating uh, that uh, racial uplift kind of narrative. And of course, you know, it's, Black churches came together and were built, being built up, Black institutions, all of that needed to be documented. And so there were Black photographers on hand to do that and to um, help disseminate this information. So it's really interesting you say that because you know, engaging with your films the last week or so, 
I was looking at the photographs I have of my family and and um, I think even in the 20th century it continued because there would be um, people going to churches, you know, doing, doing sort of mass <laughs> uh, photog uh, photography of cam uh, families and people making reservations. And mm -hmm. I remember a friend um, coming over to my house once and looking at the pictures of myself and my families that we have the exact same kind of um, design of photograph. It, 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 the same photographer probably came to your church or some somebody who liked them came to your church and did the same thing. Yeah, and, uh, and then also there was a black press mm -hmm. that was, you know, um, emerging in a forceful way and also with photography, you know, with W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, 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 The Crisis and mm -hmm. uh, he published images, uh, had the favorite, uh, you know, certain graduation images, had favorite that fam, uh, uh, be beautiful baby images. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of this communal celebration across in this like kind of across um, geography and across uh, different families. So it wasn't necessarily a genetic narrative. It was this kind of general racial uplift narrative as well. So in all of your films, you, you are in all your films that I think I've seen that and, and you have a presence, a voice, and and you know your, your imagery. So mm -hmm. I was curious uh, if how you if when you approach a project, if you're going to think, well, how am I going to be in it this time, or you know something like that, or or to help shape the narrative, frame the film, and you do it in this film particularly, I, I recall, in relationship to your father, as a way to, I think, bring him in to have. You know, talk about his his wanting to engage or lack him wanting to engage in the in the project and in the in the um, the the way of the way that your 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 family and your grandfather in particular um, what to, to document and, and 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 form the family and that your father kind of was kind of resistant. So I'd like you to talk a bit about that framing. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to say that. Um, a lot of the, the like the work I do, they it falls within documentary, but it's it's really a more process oriented. Mm -hmm. it, it's you know the, I I I'm an artist who works within documentary, and so mm -hmm. um, so it's you know it's, it's I don't want to go too deeply into that that area, but it is um, you know there's a, a kind of more of a a kind of frame for the kind of work I do maybe in Africa and Europe, you know, in terms of essay based kinds of films. Mm -hmm. um, and and also uh, around the all the stuff that happens around the film that the, the film is a culmination of a lot of different um, uh, uh, different journeys. Um, but in terms of the, I didn't think I was going to be in Through a Lens Darkly. Um, mm -hmm. At some okay. point, I realized I we needed someone to talk about the cost of not proactively engaging in the issue of representation and mm -hmm. accepting like what happens when we're not proactively creating a frame for ourselves um as opposed to uh, you know uh, the, this accepting what society is like you know kind of uh projecting onto us mm -hmm. and um and just to to, to kind of give a, a kind of almost like a um a way to think about it in a in a way that is a life and death kind of situation, but from the emotional aspect. And so mm -hmm. it really occurred to me while I was writing and rewriting and rewriting the script mm -hmm. for the film that you know the the you had this diametrically opposed narratives. My grandfather who couldn't take enough images of us, you know, wanted to fill the world with images of his family, his extended family, his church family, black folk, you know, um, you know, even as you mentioned earlier, filming off the TV screen, mm -hmm. uh, when those rare moments when when both black Americans, but also African liberation movements occurred, and were broadcast on television. So my father, wasn't around enough to, to photograph and he was also ambivalent around um, around uh, issue, certain issues you know with regards to beauty um, with regards to self-acceptance um, and you know it, it ultimately had a real impact on mm -hmm. us you know and mm -hmm. I, I, and I, I think it in some ways it really it, it's not a surprise that both my brother and myself, are engaged in this this kind of visual kind of you know narrative um, mm -hmm. 
you know, me through principally through film and uh, writing and storytelling and my brother through photography, art and storytelling in that way as well. But um, yeah, so, so that, that uh, and because my father was not able to take images and was not able to like affirm in a way, ultimately that loss is, is a kind of hole, it's an ache, it's a, um, it's, you know, I mean, so many of us, um, you know, particularly African American folk, you know, the, the, um, whether if a parent, you know, is, you know, is really capsized by this society, um, or, and the ways in which race and racism, and this, this kind of general uh, push or disenfranchisement in terms of the ability to affirm oneself and what one, and people who look like one and one's progeny and um, that that is something that that I felt like I, I, I there was no one else in the film who could do that okay <laughs> okay I said it's a dirty job but somebody's <laughs> got to do it right so I said okay I'm gonna dig in and, and you know of course you know when you put yourself in the film it's not as light as just putting yourself in you have to yeah. I mean you know you're talking about hours of therapy you have to really you know peel the onion back you have to you know say something that you know really like you know I mean not say something that's light but like you know I mean it's really always living very close to the knife you know you're mm -hmm. it's a lot of um it's you know it's, it's painful it's difficult and you know um you know including the stuff I talked about in terms of the sexuality, you know, mm -hmm. like who doesn't get in mm -hmm. the black family album, who gets erased, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, having to tell the family secrets, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that is, um, you know, so once I, you know, dip my toe in and, you know, began to be a character in that way to talk about um, this, this, this war of images and its impact on my particular psyche, you know, and our psyche is kind of a stand-in, uh, you know, just when I was able to go all the way and, you know, make the statement I was making. And yet, well, it's, thank you for allowing us to see your, see you and be vulnerable in that way. Mm, thank, because, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank sure. you. And then there was this other part of it, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, the digital diaspora part, you know. Yes, thank you. I was going to, that okay. Was okay. We're going to segue okay. right into that. Go tell us about that and the connection with um, through a lens darkly. Yeah. Well, um, with my previous film, Twelve Disciples of Nelson Mandela, I had taken my stepdad's uh, photographic archive back to South Africa and introduced it to a, uh, a new generation of young activists and mm -hmm. and also people who were in the photographs to help them remember or re remember, put back together the story of, of the anti-apartheid movement that was for the most part, the global movement was um, not something that a lot of South Africans knew about. And mm. my dad, who raised me from the time I was nine after my father left when I was about six or se seven, mm -hmm. um, um, my South African dad, he, he, he had a profound influence on me, similar to the, that of my grandfather. And so mm -hmm. but we had a difficult relationship. So I took his archive back and you know, reunited people. And, and I saw the power of kind of connecting people with their history using, the, using photography. And, um, and so I wanted to continue that process and I couldn't because at the end of a film, you're exhausted and you don't wanna, you know, it's hard to start something new. So when I was um, conceiving of Through a Lens Darkly and thinking about, well, the images, um, I thought, well, why don't we do a kind of outreach project that runs parallel to the film? You know, cause I, mm -hmm. I, some of the, um, I was raising some of the money through uh, European, um, um, Fest, uh, festivals and not so much festivals, European markets. And mm -hmm. I saw that there was a lot of transmedia emphasis. And so I said, well, we can do transmedia. This is the back in 2006, seven. And so I created a, a kind of prototype at Bayvac in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this digital diaspora started mm -hmm. in some ways there. And um, I started shopping it around and people said, oh, it's interesting, but we'd like you to come and do a live version of it. You know, mm -hmm. it was gonna be an online kind of thing. And so I started doing it and all of a sudden I was in the roadshow business. And so people started inviting us, like, you know, it started in 2009 and to come to a place and help people kind of connect with their family photographs. And, and at that time, it was the very beginning of, you know, Facebook, obviously, which started in 2007. So a lot of people didn't have a lot of stuff digitized. You know, it wasn't, 
as much as obviously as now. And so people would come, some people came early on in digital diaspora roadshows with trunk loads of images. So we said, we'll take 10 to 15 and create a story out of those and, um, and, and we'll digitize those for you. And then we'll, you know, kind of create this, this story and it'll have, it'll be on, um, on our website. And, and, and then we do this live show where we present to uh, a large audience, a large community, the stories we surface there. Well, and back so, up a little bit. How did they, you know, there was, you were saying that people came to you and wanted you to do that, but how did they know about um, doing that? How did, how yeah, did well, they reach out to you? The places that invited us, like the IMA, Integrated Media Association, they were the first ones. So they asked us to be a part of their kind of, uh, almost like a kind of a keynote, you know, and do this mm -hmm. as a, a kind of keynote. And so they they had a bunch, they were our principal partner. And then we reached out to a whole bunch of, this is in Atlanta in 2009. So we reached out to a whole bunch of other part, potential partners, mm -hmm. Emory and a whole bunch of other folks, and we got the word out. And so people signed up. Mm -hmm. And then when the next one we did was at the um, Silver Docks in, um, mm -hmm. in Maryland. And the same thing happened. It's, you know, they saw what we did there and they wanted us to replicate it. And, and mm -hmm. in fact, some of it came out of the Black Public Media, which was a, a big supporter of this transmedia. Uh, both Les, pardon me, Leslie and Fields Cruz, uh, the present uh, executive director, and also the previous uh, executive director, Jackie Jones, mm -hmm. uh, was doing a lot of workshops and helping um, uh, uh, Black folks think about alternative ways of tell storytelling. And mm -hmm. so, um, so out of the, the kinds of presentations we did with them, these other things opened up. And mm -hmm. then after one would always lead to another. So after mm -hmm. about 10 years, we, we've done about 75 of these uh, wow. roadshow events, um, you know, very little marketing. Um, um, uh, people would find, find us. And, and, and what I realized was that we started sourcing images that were taken by black photographers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of these images outside of black institutions, a lot of these images were not collected as, you know, as Richard Powell says in the film, you know, they weren't collected by museums. They weren't collected mm -hmm. by mainstream quote unquote, or white museums and or national, you know, or state museums. Um, they were kept in people's families, mm -hmm. albums, their walls. And so, so ultimately, as a byproduct of doing this project, this wasn't mm -hmm. the initial kind of impetus for it, but as a byproduct, we actually built up an archive mm -hmm. that at the time we finished the film was approximately somewhere between six and, six and 7,000 images mm -hmm. of African-American folk. Uh, from the family album. So there were images that, you know, you would never have seen before. And they make up maybe about a fifth or maybe a between, somewhere between a fifth and two fifths of the, the 954 images in Through a Lens Darkly were images that came out of this, this touring road show. So two questions, the, the touring road show, do you have a list of what, all the places you went to somewhere? That's yeah. one, okay, okay. And yeah. I could put it. I could put it in the chat. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we it's uh, we have a website. Um, mm -hmm. Several website, but this website one world one family dot me, and you could mm -hmm. look at schedules, mm -hmm. and you could see like our Flickr pages of all our different um, of the different places we've been since two thousand nine. They include Brazil a couple of times, two or three times mm -hmm. at least two times uh canada a couple of times ethiopia um and a bunch of other folks and then all across the united states okay and and the images are also there or there some of the images are there some, of the, some of the images are there some of the document mostly mo more documentation of um of the road shows are there rather than the the images but we do have images there as well we now have an archive of upwards of uh, fifty five thousand images and we're in the process of putting together uh, creating an institute for the project okay and so is was this kind of also an inspiration for family pictures usa what's the relationship 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, about two years after I finished through a lens darkly, I was um, at um, on a fellowship at Dartmouth and speaking with Nolan Walker, who's at ITVS, AT, ITVS, hey, Nolan. <laughs> and so, you know, I was just talking about the, the, the idea that this could be a, 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 TV, a TV series. And, mm -hmm. and we were also working with the Wincoat Foundation that, that was uh, supporting um, the project. And so we developed the idea over the course of a couple of years Mm -hmm. And then slowly we got money to begin the um, the first uh, pilot ep episode, which was uh, sh shot in Detroit in mm -hmm. 2017. Mm -hmm. And then we 2017. Then we worked on it for about two, um, about a year, and then we got the money from CPB, and they wanted us to go to red states and <laughs> and take the project. Why? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, more rural, rural yeah, area. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, because, you know, p post the election, the 2016 mm -hmm. election, mm -hmm. they were like, well, let's, you know, let's, let's get, give some, you know, see, see what's happening down there and, and give some, so, uh, some, some kind of attention to mm -hmm. these areas. And so mm -hmm. we chose uh, Southwest Florida. Okay. And we chose that because of uh, one of the uh, co-executive producers, uh, Amy Schumacher, was there, and she was initially in South Carolina. We we're going to go there, and then someone else we were working with, uh, Rachel, uh, uh, Rachel um, Rainey, it, it was in North Carolina, and so we decided to go with North Carolina and Southwest Florida. Yeah, so that answers the question. I was wondering how you chose those three places that we saw um, in in the. The three different um, venues, states. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we actually spoke with, we were in dialogue with 20 different public TV stations. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we were trying to figure out which ones. And, you know, ultimately, you know, we just made sure we had, you know, the pot was uh, sweet enough for the funders that were interested in supporting the project. So mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, that's how we, uh, how we ultimately uh, made that decision. Well, you know, and it was great watching them and I was seeing how, you know, the people were very excited to make connections with each other, um, you know, across families, across racial families. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, you know, there was excitement and everything, but I was also feeling there was little discomfort and, and um, you know, with Black families meeting their white families or whatever, you know, people. Um, represented the people who were were the slave masters and 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 things like that and so I wanted to hear about how you navigated through all that yeah well you know I mean the thing about the family album is that it's sovereign you know people are able to tell their story and you know it's my story can coexist with your story, even mm -hmm. though there's tension and we, the way in which we interpret is different. The way in which, you know, the people who were living at that time when the pictures mm -hmm. were taken might have thought, felt differently. I mean, uh, one of the things that, that occurred to me when I did 12 Disciples of Nelson Mandela, I, I, that film started in 2000 when my dad died and mm -hmm. I had had the worst relationship with my South African stepdad. He was, you know, a part of it was the inheritance of my my biological father and his abandonment and his ambiv ambivalence and and uh, and part of it was because of his cultural divide. We were two American kids and he was an African traditional father. And so when I went to his funeral with my video camera in 2000, I was just going to say goodbye to him. And I get there and I realized that uh, number one, uh, in South Africa, he is seen not as my stepdad. But he's seen as my father because that's the mm -hmm. kind of the way which family mm -hmm. is structured there. Mm -hmm. And then number two, my head was thinking, "Stepdad, I'm going to say goodbye." My heart was like, "Oh my God, my father's dead." Mm -hmm. And it was just like I was not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the emotional because and it just so there's these two different stories. One you're conscious of, you know, the dominant, and then the other, you know, boom, when you're faced with certain reality, and so. So, you know, I, that's, that informs the way in which I approach this project, um, you know, allowing people to come together and trying to create a kind of safe space for people to come together. And, you know, and there's a lot of ambivalence and that it's okay. You know, there might be ambivalence across racial lines or across class lines or across gender lines. 
um, um, across racial lines and mm -hmm. um, or even within the family, sibling mm -hmm. narrative or you know yeah. generational narratives right. and you know i mean and people i mean some people are people i might not normally kind of fraternize with or you know mm. be in a relationship with but yeah but you know we are human we are we're both americans as well and um and so um i feel like discovery is yeah i was making television Mm -hmm. um, that's where I started. I started out in television even before I became an artist. And so I was making television and doing this art project. We actually had over 100 people in each of these particular locations, Detroit, mm -hmm. Southwest Florida, and North Carolina, come in and share their family photographs. We only used about 20% of that material mm -hmm. in the show, but we were doing this road show, you know, because that's what we do. And that's what, what our mechanism was that, you know, at the time it's mm -hmm. just kind of I mean, it's shifting as we go forward. But um that 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 tension is is also something that makes for good tv mm -hmm. <laughs> you know but i it, for me it was really important that everyone felt at, when they left uh empowered you know um enriched in some way um not yeah. disrespected um mm -hmm. so you know so like someone came in southwest florida i mean there were more confederate images that were in, in florida that was a big surprise <laughs> in North well, that, that part of florida right that's that's the, that's <laughs> alabama basically okay yeah and people a lot of people after the civil war migrated down mm -hmm. and so um both formerly enslaved folks you know free folks and then uh the seminoles you know because yeah. of wars and mm -hmm. so it was it was amazing to discover so much of America through this project, you know, and the American narratives. And so um, I really you know, appreciated that, you know, Detroit, so much of the narrative was informed by the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. And that also fueled a lot of the photography, urban photography, mm -hmm. you know, that, and you took a picture in the studio and sent it back home. This is here, I'm alive, I'm here, here's mm -hmm. you know, here my family, here's my friends, here's my life now, this is my new style. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great. I mean, and, and all the different programs, Black people are always in it. So that's great, you know, and, but you also expanded and, and Native folk uh, and all of them too. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And not just the Seminole, but in North, the North Carolina and in, in uh, Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, for, for me, the, the series, the, the power of the series has to do with kind of decentering the narrative, you know, decolonizing the narrative. So it's not like, you know, the Native Americans, the African Americans, the uh, Latinos, all are seen from the perspective of a kind of a white kind of uh, patriarchal gaze, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. there's a, a certain equivalency, you know, because they all, all are sovereign, they all mm -hmm. have their family narratives, they're all building. So, so it just happened, you know, the way in which it's structured, it, it allows for a disruption of a certain type of, you know, historical commonplace narrative that is America, um, that America has embraced, you know, in terms of seeing ourselves all refracted, you know, as these kinds of, um, you know, whether it's minorities or, you know, whatever term you, you want to use, mm -hmm. you know, a BIPOC, you know, it's just like, we are here, mm -hmm. and we have been here, and this is us, and, you know, and this is you, and this is its places that we've come together now, you know, in the past, you know, and hopefully giving a potential for the future in terms of, you know, let's see and respect, we see and respect our humanity. And, and there's also the family dynamics. I remember in the Detroit um, um, episode, there were the two sisters standing up and one was talking about her mother not being supportive of her going to show business and the other sister just right away said, well, Mom, she, mom could do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. And I thought, oof, <laughs> you know, them, you know, having that kind of, it, it, you know, it seemed, it seemed like they, you know, they were cool about it. They weren't like after the camera went off. It was like, how dare you say that? Uh, but anyway, I'm sure. Um, maybe I'm not sure if if you encountered anything like that that would happen during yeah. the filming. Well, I mean, you know, because. You know, as I said earlier, in terms of, I have filmed so many of my family and close family, mm -hmm. extended family friends. And so for me, it was really important that people leave built up. And, mm -hmm. and also I've done so much therapy <laughs> to be able to speak 
in this kind of grounded way in these films, you know, go through this journey, take people along a journey. There has to be a journey that you take people along, right? So, so, um, so uh, there is a certain aspect of the project which which has a kind of therapeutic mm. um, kind of leaning, you know. Mm. And so, so, I, you know, what it allowed the sisters to do was to stop and listen to one another. You know, without having to say my narrative is the right one, yours is the wrong one, my narrative is, you know, is correct, yours is, you know, faulty. And some of that can be found going back to vintage families of value when, mm -hmm. you know, like, look at three sibling groups, queer sibling groups, they gave video cameras to. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they each had to like you, they use media to disrupt their hierarchical, hierarchical kind of communication. And um, and so the sisters actually are like, I mean, they 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 publicly have said this was like going five years of therapy because they you know kind of disrupted this this lockstep that they had going on that was really irritating to both of them and um mm. and they were able to like you know through this process because it wasn't just like you know we didn't we spent time with them mm -hmm. and um you know because that was the nature we had to film in different places over different periods of time and um, and so the byproduct was that they were able to, you know, build off of that base of love, mm -hmm. and to be able to see one another and hear one another and say, okay, your story is sovereign, and my story is sovereign. Okay, okay. Um, I want to encourage people to send in questions. I don't. I only see one um, about uh, about you using a. Please talk about how you worked with a voice coach related to your decision to play a role in your decision to play a role uh use voice over etc how did you come to the decision to use a coach what was that approach process like oh wow thank you for that um uh so i have to do a shout out to valicia phillips who mm -hmm. is has been the voice coach for several of my films, um, not all of them, but several of them. And um, she's based in LA and um, does a lot of different things. Um, but she actually started working with me and Amy Akata and was able to help me source an, a voice, pardon me, mm -hmm. that I had not known was inside. Mm -hmm. And that, cause that was a very mythopoetic kind of narrative. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think with 12 Disciples as well, that which is another voice. Mm -hmm. um, with Through a Lens Darkly, there was another voice, another character that I occupied. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was, uh, and the person who was my coach in that uh, project was a, a poet and, and a storyteller by the name of L Linnell Moyes. And mm -hmm. She, I met at, uh, while we were both doing a, um, a kind of LGBT African diaspora kind of um, panel at NYU with Mancha Diawara and, Sarah, and uh, Eve Sandler that they mm -hmm. put on a few years ago. And so um, we started talking and then I realized, you know, I wanted it to be, have this uh, a poetic kind of narrative, you know, that, that was the other aspect around Through a Lens Darkly that it was informed by a certain sense of poetry and um and so i decided to work with her valicia had already had moved to california and so so it was great to work with linnell and and to, to 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 find that voice and use that voice in the piece and um and then with uh, uh family pictures usa i used uh, several different uh voice coaches uh to um to access uh, a more kind of neutral but kind of tv kind of s kind of um uh, character okay so i don't want us to leave without talking about the diaspora connection the last time we were together face to face was in brazil and you had just done a project down there so please talk about the the i guess brazil and maybe even that the african continent connection that you um projects you've worked on um through the, the making a diaspora connection yeah, well, the um, thank you for that, uh, mm -hmm. Um, and it was you know, just I, I feel bad for what's going on in Brazil. It's yeah. you know, uh, I, um, I, uh, um, I, I guess first I just want to say that we were both there and we, we talked about Marlon Riggs's work, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, you eloquently gave the keynote for the um, uh, Tongues and Tides screening, which was really beautiful mm -hmm. in Portuguese. Yes. And I was like, yay, <laughs> that was really impressive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was great to be there with, uh, with also Ria as well. And um, Ria comes from the Ria National Museum of the Af African American um, um, his Arts and his culture and history yeah, yeah you see exactly and um yeah marlin's work influenced me tremendously i mean uh, my focus in terms of teaching at yale in terms of the aesthetics i use has a lot to do with community photo, community storytelling and um and marlin's tongues and tide was such a, a, a mind-blowing and just mind expanding mm -hmm. example of that we became friends i collaborated with him um, you know, just to, to use all these different kinds of link, use, use media to link different communities and amplify, you know, the voices so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that is, is, you know, is, you can see throughout all of my films. Uh, and so, um, uh, so with, uh, with, um, Brazil, I was there to do a workshop, you know, when I first started shooting in Brazil in the 1996, um, there were very few Afro-Brazilians were in college, higher education, you know, mm -hmm. people were really kept down. You know, I think that if you read the newspaper about what's going on in Brazil right now, and you see mm -hmm. Lula, um, the former president, and it's based on his last name, um, is- um, De Silva. De Silva, Lula De Silva, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and his uh, successor really implemented this uh, program to lift up millions of Afro-Brazilians out of poverty, open up, you know, through a series of kind of affirmative action, which is, you know, was there so mm -hmm. that you have much more, for the first time last year, you had equivalency of the demographic representation of Black Brazilians in the colleges. And mm -hmm. so as part of that, they invited me down to come and, and do a uh, kind of digital diaspora project, bringing community students, professors, uh, staff together in this workshop around storytelling using family photographs. You know, Afro-Brazilians, you know, also, you know, many coming from, you know, dire poverty, you know, also had their own family photographs that, they, you know, that, that go way back as well and stories, but they have those narratives, just like our narratives have been suppressed. And so, mm -hmm. so they were really inspired by Through a Lens Darkly. And so I've been doing a lot of work with uh, pro, uh, academics there, cultural mm -hmm. leaders there, um, um, you know, since I left Brazil, uh, since I first started going to Brazil in 1995, I've been doing a lot of work. So it's like 25 years. And um, of course, I made a film there, Amy Akata, That's My Face, which was that, you know, did, did, did a, you know, an amazing um, project, um, which is, you know, in some ways, um, it was well received. And but it's changed so much. So, so my relationship with Brazil is, um, it's like extended family. And mm. it's really important. What I see now in Brazil is a lot of Bra Afro-Brazilians are going to South Africa. It's cheaper to get there for them. And they, they have a relationship. They're also studying apartheid and mm. applying it to the Brazilian situation. Um, a lot of folks are coming here, studying with, with us. There's this kind of, uh, kind of a loop. And that it's really powerful. And I also teach around that as well. Um, and so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I hope to bring Family Pictures USA to Brazil okay. as well um, and, um, and continue that relationship. It's really important to me. You know, I, have, I have a lot of people that I love dearly in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like being home, wasn't it? It was just yeah. like great. Yeah. So um, Family Pictures USA, are there going to be more episodes? Yes, there will be more actually seasons and we're developing season two. Mm -hmm. um, it might be in PBS, it might be elsewhere. We're in okay. the process of uh, making those decisions, we'll see. Um, and, um, but, but we're also doing these virtual shows. We've been like, as part of the um, Skip Gates is the Black Church. We did a Family Pictures, uh, Black Church in Philadelphia. We do like once, once every other month. Um, and so we're really excited to be continuing to do that. We also did something where we did uh, Black Families Through Queer Eyes, 
event we did um you know we brought together folks to you know talk about their queer ancestors um we you know it's like kind of like using the format of bringing people together to talk about the family album uh but through their work you know we've gathered different artists uh together periodically uh with our family pictures so you could actually join our email yeah. list by going on <laughs> <laughs> familypicturesusa.org and you could just sign up Mm -hmm. and um and reach out to us but you could also follow us on instagram at family pictures usa and then we have family pictures usa facebook group which is mm -hmm. a very active group mm -hmm. um if you want to like explore your own family narratives and tell stories we have a blog that we accept submissions for and we help get the word out you know for writers mm -hmm. uh whether old or young doesn't matter uh artists as well um, and then, um, and so we have familypicturesusa.com and, um, and then, um, yeah, so, so we're, you know, we're in the process of, of moving that forward and we have several other projects that we're developing. I'm working on a, a film about my mom because I've made all these films, <laughs> you know, where she's in yeah. and some of them kind of feature her, but, you know, my mom was a scientist and, mm -hmm. and so, you know, after I've always wanted to, you know, do a film about her and the people that she taught, you know, both here and in East Africa when we, when I, that's why I grew up partly in East Africa. She was teaching in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It's part of the Pan-Africanist movement, teaching young women physics and chemistry. And so I'm making a film entitled My Mom, the Scientist. And it's it's also an essay film looking at, looking at, you know, using her story as a way to actually get into the stories around, uh, you know, Black women and, and, and Black uh, gender non-conforming folks uh, in in the sciences and That's, through, and looking at science through their eyes like what is it what does science mean like you know when we think about science you know we generally think about the lab but science is also all around mm -hmm. us and so you know a kind of more holistic kind of approach um, you know and also thinking about like you know what enslaved people brought here in terms of mm -hmm. their medicinal skills and scientific and technological skills as well so mm -hmm. that's my first very first film that i made was called crisis who will do science and that was a film that came i started making after i had left science i i did science in college and high school i went to bronx high school of science and I did biology in college and, and i decided i wanted to become a film i needed to become a filmmaker a storyteller mm -hmm. artist and so um so this is going full circle that's fantastic and it's, it's great. I mean, I look forward to it and I'm a science math phobic person, but I, I <laughs> give me a way to engage with science. Uh, there was one question and I don't wanna ignore it, but um, just before we go, is could you explain the abrupt move in Through a Lens Darkly from the harrowing sections on lynching and the betrayal of World War I vets to James Van Der Zee? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, the, um, it, it, it just, yeah, you know, having studied that, you know, for this film, mm -hmm. you know, there was this, there was always, it just seemed like there was this forever, this repeating pattern in terms of African American, the African American story in the American Family mm -hmm. album, you know, two steps forward, and then one step back, you know, mm -hmm. like reconstruction, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and, you know, the dismantling, the violence, uh, you know, um, a violent take back of white supremacy, and uh, reestablishment of white supremacy. And so that that narrative just kept getting repeated. And, you know, and it was something that was is right there in the historical record. And so, um, you know, but still through it all, we kept moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important. You know, we didn't we didn't let ourselves down. And I would just say the other thing around the lynching images, we tried, we actually used those images in a way that was very, very different than they had historically been used. Do we mm -hmm. you know, really use them to talk about the um the terror and the tragedy within the white families who were, mm -hmm. you know, had to deny. Mm -hmm. uh, go into it, it on reality, you know, to mm -hmm. deny the humanity of the, the people that they were terrorizing and they were lynching and they were, you know, and so um, in addition to, you know, this other, um, 
this, this, you know, not because because a lot of the images were taken by white photographers to kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, from a certain perspective, and we wanted to disrupt that, you know, the perspective was this is the one we caught this, this criminal, he was criminal because he was black, he was just already a criminal. And we were like, no, look at look at, you know, these people who are here with this, you know, burnt charred bar body, mm -hmm. how can mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, and these images mm -hmm. are in people's family albums and you know, and Bibles. And so, um, so yeah, so, so that's, yeah, I don't know if that, that helps, but. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. And, and I, can I say one last thing? Sure. I, um, Black Public Media is, um, they had, uh, is doing their uh, Afro pop season. And I was part of it several times with That's My Face, but also with 12 Disciples and Nelson Mandela. And this is their 13th season coming up, I think in a, uh, a month or two. And um, they're showing an amazing film by someone who is a, a dear friend and also a collaborator. Uh, uh, first time, uh, her first uh, documentary after many decades, a, a, de a decade or two uh, as a journalist. Her name is Lucina Fisher. And she's uh, made a film called Mama Gloria about a 75 year old black trans um, activist in Chicago. And it's just what a heartwarming film and so important. And, um, and so I just wanted to encourage people to check it out. And um, it's the next one you do the next um, African film, um, African diaspora film club um, program next month. Oh, great, great, great. <laughs> Mama Gloria, yay! We, did, we didn't ask Thomas to do that, but thank you very much. <laughs> great. So that's, that's really exciting. So yeah, definitely check that out and support. It, it. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, so familypicturesusa.com. Yeah, familypicturesusa.com. Um, you can find me on uh, Instagram. Um, and I, I actually hike a lot. So I put hiking pictures up in addition to where I'm doing my next talk. And sometimes I did various talks at, at various colleges and mm -hmm. also my classes. And so Thomas Allen Harris at Thomas underscore Allen underscore Harris in Instagram, but also Family Pictures USA on Instagram. And uh, I'm also very active on LinkedIn. So Thomas Allen Harris and LinkedIn, but Family Pictures USA is just as active. And then on uh, Facebook, Family Pictures USA on Facebook. Thank you so much, Thomas. This has been terrific. I look forward to um, seeing you again, hopefully sometime in person, but you know, Yay. in the meantime, seeing your, seeing your films. Thank you, Cornel. Stay well and everybody, please stay, stay well and hope you're able to get vaccinated and take care of your family and everything. All right. Thank you both for this Bye. wonderful conversation, Cornelius and Thomas. I'm so excited to, to follow your upcoming work as well. Um, and I also wanna thank Leslie again and Black Public Media for co-presenting this program. And thank you, Thomas, for already announcing our next African Diaspora Film Club. Uh, that was well-timed. Um, so we really encourage everyone to join us again on April 11th at 5 p.m. the same time. And we will be discussing Mama Gloria and the information to join that event is in the chat as well. Um, I also encourage folks, um, there'll be a quick program survey. We're putting the information in the chat and it should pop up afterwards. If you can just take a moment to fill it out, um, all of your feedback really helps us know how to best serve our community. So we appreciate that. And if you are able to support the museum financially, um, we really appreciate don donations. Uh, you can donate through our website, which is moadsf.org or um, via phone by typing the number 56512 um, and then texting MOAD SF. So thank you all for attending and continuing to support and engage. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia. <laughs> Take care.